Hello, my name is Katherine Vetter. I am the publicity and social media graduate assistant this year for the Stony Brook Music Department. And I am here for Mentor Monday. This is our first interview and we are interviewing piano professor Christina Dahl. Uh, Tina has been on the faculty at Stony Brook for over 20 years. Uh, she's one of our distinguished piano and chamber music profession professors. And she has recently taken over as director of graduate studies for the music department. Uh, we are super excited to have her here and to interview her. We're going to talk about her time here at Stony Brook and her new position and also a really cool podcast that she has. All right, so Tina is here. We're going to bring her on. Hello. Hey, Catherine. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's all good. This is our first one, so I expected some, some technical kinks. <laughs> yes, I know, and I've never done Instagram Live before, so I was like, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I've done like one and it was a very controlled environment. So this is right. a little new for me too. Yeah. How are you? I'm pretty good. Yeah. Good. I, uh, yeah. Just living the online life. So. Right. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. How are you doing? Fine. Um, that's the same for me. It's been ever since uh, starting the grad director job, it's been just a ton of emailing and Zoom calls and but it also feels cool, like um, some virtual version of walking down the hall or popping into the office or, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's weird how sometimes online can feel like sometimes more disconnected, but then also a little, sometimes a little more intimate as well. Well, that's what um, Gil Kalish has said about teaching. I know mm -hmm. a lot of people have struggled with um online lessons. And of course, there's so many issues with it, sound quality and stuff like that. But um, he has said that he feels like the connection to the student is sometimes a lot more intense, because you know, it's just staring into somebody's eyes and mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. Total focus of, of a video. Call. Yeah, uh, I have a student too. I have a younger student who didn't really pay attention a lot in in person lessons. And online, he actually pays attention a lot more. So it's actually a little unexpected. But. That's interesting. I'm kind of trying to move so the sun's not in my face. <laughs> I have, I walk, I, ever since quarantine, um, which was March 13th, basically was the, my last trip to Stony Brook. Um, I have a group of neighbor ladies uh, here in Cleveland who walk every morning, usually at 6.30 or at 7. And we've been walking religiously ever since for five months. Um, it's yeah. a really and one of them is a second grade teacher and so we hear a lot about how um, yeah trying to engage students at that age online is both works better and doesn't some of the kids just can't focus but are really used to screen time already so yeah it definitely depends on the student um, and what they're comfortable with right yeah very cool um, I have a few questions for you just uh, like Stony Brook mostly related um, sure. And then if anyone has questions, they can pop them in the comments and we'll take a few of those as well. Yeah. Um, you've definitely become sort of this cornerstone of the Stony Brook Music Department. And um, you're, you're just such a big part of it as piano professor, but also chamber, uh, like uh, such an influence on the chamber department. And then now you're also in this new position of director of graduate studies. So thank you, uh, congratulations. Thanks. Um, what has been your favorite part about your time at Stony Brook so far? Wow, that's a big question because it's been 26 or 27 years. And you know, I was okay. also a student. I don't know if you knew I did three years of a DMA and then I got a job um, at yes, Lawrence. I did know that. That's so cool. <laughs> so it's been um, really more than 30 years association with the department. Um, I, I, I questioned whether to come back you know, after having been a student, but I was I, I got I was so welcomed in the department then as a faculty person and Gil made it so easy for me to make which would, could have been a really hard transition actually, yeah. um, and I love that it's always been kind of stuck together with tape and glue and band aids the department where faculty do so much more than they normally in other departments, but it also means we have ownership over what happens for mm -hmm. better or for worse. Um, and where at least my impression as a student, maybe I was deluded, was also that students have a big voice. 
in the department. I did my first two degrees at Peabody Conservatory. I loved it there and I had a great mm -hmm. time, but I never felt like, you know, I was part of the structure of the department that way. But I, yeah, I as I became a and then that's true just as a faculty person. And even being in the grad director job, you guys will be astonished at how little I know about what I'm doing in that position. But because we're all asked to kind of communicate that way, it sort of works, you know. Mm -hmm. Someone like Dan Weymouth, who's so generous and compassionate, he's still been just like um, in that who wants to be a millionaire where you have like a lifeline or something. I, he's, you know, so available to help. So I love that community mindedness about it. And the fact that we can, then we're kind of free to, to pivot sometimes when we need to, like making the decision as a department to be online weeks ago, long before other schools did, seeing that bringing all of you and having you sign leases and stuff and then pulling the plug would have been really far worse. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. For sure. I definitely feel that like sense of um, community and camaraderie almost in like running the department because our right. professors are also admin and TAs and graduate assistants have, you know, say in not only like grading and stuff, but actually running classes or how the program yeah. works. So it's definitely we, unique. We have students on search committees, which mm -hmm. I think in other places and on big universe, um, departmental committees like the GSC. Um, and I, I want to see more of that. That's a goal for me in the grad director position because we are a graduate program and we have a big and thriving undergrad program too, but this mm -hmm. is going to be a review. And all of you, I feel, are adults. Some already launched into your careers, but many just poised on the edge of it with so much um, knowledge and so many resources for us uh, mm -hmm. as we move. Of course, it's like a huge time of transition right now. So, of course, yeah, and even including like the students on all the committees over the summer and stuff was I thought a really um, awesome push from the school to to kind of include us in that decision. Right. Yeah. I know the students on the safety and space committee that I chair were integral, crucial mm -hmm. voices. Yeah, in definitely. Um, so with this new position of director of graduate studies, you say like, I don't really know what's going on, right? Like we all do. Um, but what what do you see as an opportunity, like of this position as an opportunity? What are you looking forward to most to do with this position? Well, um, hopefully not mess it up. That's the first, <laughs> the first directive, you know, just like don't try not to mess anything up. Yes. But the <laughs> thing Dan told me about the position, I had thought, you know, hmm, graduate director might be a lot of bureaucracy in a way because mm -hmm. there's all the forms to fill out and getting people through degrees. But Dan said to me, no, you know, really that position is kind of the student advocate position um, mm -hmm. because you are trying to help everyone navigate um, right. degrees, registration, orientation, scholarship, all that stuff. So in that sense, it feels like, oh, okay, now instead of having a studio of 14 or 16 mm -hmm. people, now I have a studio of 200 <laughs> and I like that feeling. Hope, I hope I can be helpful in that role. Um, I like thinking of it that way. That helps, you know, when I just go away for two hours and, and see 60 emails, like, uh Oh, but yeah. <laughs> in, okay. It, it's also, I do like games and puzzles. And so it does, at least right now, it feels like a giant, Rubik's cube of like, how does this work? Or what does this yeah. degree? Mean? That's awesome. So with, with going online for this semester, I mean, you were on the safety committee, and then also stepping into this new position, you obviously have a lot of say about what's going on. Um, and with going online, there's obviously a lot of challenges that come with it, especially for the incoming students for the and music department. Um, I was wondering if you could share a little bit about what the professors in the department have come up with in terms of creating a community online, especially for those incoming students. Right. Okay. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, I think all of us, first of all, are better teachers than we were in the spring, or I'll just speak for myself. Um, mm -hmm. 
I feel like my setup is better. I, I kind of get better how it works, um, how long. You know, when I taught in person, I would teach six, seven, eight hours in a row. You can't do that on Zoom. No. And you're aware that the person you're working with may have just been on a seminar for three hours. So mm -hmm. things like that. But in terms of the larger community, we've really made a push. You know, in the spring, it was all about helping students who were thrown into like losing their housing on campus or having to get back to their home country or not being able to get back to their home country because of quarantining issues. Now it's about, okay, we're set into that. We've got to do this for a whole semester. So um, what kinds of online stuff can we do? Can, can we now run chamber music? And the answer is yes. Can we have SBSO? Um, Alan Kay's syllabus for SBSO, I think is really exciting because he's using the first segment to do uh, audition prep, which we don't get a chance to do enough during regular times. Yeah. And then there's this great opportunity to bring everybody who's sitting in their living room, who might be like a famous person who could never afford to see or bring, um, you know, to Stony Brook, who can now join us in a seminar or in a master class for SBSO or as a chamber music coach. Mm -hmm. um, I also, I'm trying to get this forum idea going, which I see as um, just small discussion groups for three or four weeks on a topic. We've been talking about topics like running a mock job search where people would apply with a resume and cover letter. If I can get, faculty are so busy right now, but maybe down the semester, like a little faculty committee who would actually go through the application, interview people on Skype, have them do a short master class, and then walk through the whole process, how the decisions were made so that you could see how that, that whole thing works. Um, so having, having some online discussion groups that go I think is important because we're seeing walking down the hallway and seeing each other while we're practicing. Mm -hmm. um, Chamber Music is gonna have a mixture of lectures and then also um, online playing components. And then as things get better in cities around the world um, or even across the country, encouraging some live playing, which we haven't been able to do and everyone is missing so mm -hmm. much. Eric and Arthur in their um, seminar made the decision to split it in half instead of three hours once a week, hour and a half twice a week. It's more contact with each other. It's easier on Zoom. So just stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Bill's doing a Bach Partita class for the semester in the evening, pulling in Arthur and Erica, like I did Chopin Etudes in the spring and even into summer, and engaging some alumni, at least in the piano program. Um, and I'm going to encourage my um, colleagues, the faculty, to think about that with master classes and studio classes, like maybe pull in your recent alumni who are also missing community during this, you know, this. Yeah, definitely. I know the end of last semester, um, Alan, Alan Kay, the clarinet professor, he also had, he pulled in some alumni, invited them all to the, um, to our studio class, which was really cool because, you know, sometimes as a current student, you hear their names, but you don't really know them. And then, you know, they pull in recent alumni and you get to meet them and it's kind of cool. Plus they have great insight into what's happening in the profession right now. Definitely. You know, um, you had a faculty position for 25 years. I can't tell you what it's like to go through a job search right now because it's totally different. But right. someone who won a job can actually. Yeah, definitely. It's great to connect with them. Yeah. Um, so speaking of students and professors and alumni and all these relationships, you have had so many um, transitional relationships from like student to professor, right? Um, and student to colleague, and then also with this podcast that you had this summer, um, former student to then colleague as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about like how you handle those transitions and relationships? Because I feel like you've done it so well, and it's been um, a positive thing for you. Well, thank you for saying that. I think that comes from the youngest of five kids. So um, Bill has said this too, because he was, there were two, he and his brother, and he's the youngest, and he said, yeah, you're the youngest, you always feel like you're the youngest person in the room. And now I'm at an age where I'm definitely not the youngest person in the room, but I still retain a little of that feeling. So I, I 
I do remember what it felt like to be a student. And I think that's helped me in moving to the other side, um, to being a faculty person is, I always felt for I mean, such a long time in my team that one foot was still there and being a student. Um, mm -hmm. and, and as an administrator now, it's weird to call myself that, I definitely feel like a faculty person. So I think it's, it's keeping that relationship to, the, to your past mm -hmm. and not just saying, okay, I'm this, I'm this new thing and that, that's not me anymore. I think that's very helpful. And that c comes out like being like young kid sister and then realizing, oh yeah, I'm actually a middle-aged woman, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, that's great advice of like, just always remembering kind of where you came from and your experiences. Right. Having that, um, a set, well, okay, so years ago, many years ago when I went to Tanglewood, I remember it very, it was one of those distinct moments in life that you, that just feel like an aha thing. And I was walking tired after rehearsing and walking in for dinner at Miss Hall School where we stayed and just trudging up the steps with a bunch of people. And I thought all of a sudden I had the aha moment. I was like, all I want to do in my life is be a music student. <laughs> no, I, I know so many students are. I think my mom would say the same thing about me. <laughs> I know. Well, so many, those of us who go for doctorates, it's the dirty little secret, right? We just want to stay in school. Yeah. But <laughs> when I, when I got my first faculty job, I was like, oh, I get it. Basically you just get to be a music student still <laughs> because you're in that environment. And you, you know, if you're doing concerts and practicing, you're still putting yourself in some of those situations. So um, that's what's so beautiful about the academic environment is you can remain at some level a student. And I think um, that does help in, in these transitions that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about Piano Chat, about your um, podcast <laughs> and what it was like and if we can expect more? Yeah, we can expect more. In fact, Oksana and I are trying to get together um, this week maybe and talk to Gil. I'd like to do a series of, of chats with Gil because he's got so many fantastic mm -hmm. stories in history mm -hmm. with Brooke and um, he's got a close relationship with both of us. So Oksana was my student at Stony Brook mm -hmm. a long time ago, 20 years ago. Wow. And it's so long ago that mm -hmm. I think her only as a colleague now, basically, right. it's weird to me to think. Um, she is the artistic director at Icicle Creek Center for the Arts, which has been a really important summer and winter place for a lot of students from Stony Brook, especially pianists. And um, chair of the piano department at PU out in Washington. And we've played two piano stuff, which I still think is the hardest of all chamber music. If you're not a pianist, you won't get it. I won't get it, yeah. <laughs> it's, well, it's like so narcissistic, right? Because you're mm -hmm. playing with the same instrument and it's such a huge sound. It has so many balance issues. So the fact that we love mm -hmm. to do that with each other shows, I think our relationship, um, because you really, it's really hard. You can really, I've never gotten so angry as in a duo piano <laughs> rehearsal. <Yes. laughs> so we have that. And then um, we were sitting in Icicle one summer a few years ago and a cellist looked over us and she's like, you guys should do a podcast. I like just listening to you talk <laughs> because we're always, you know, we were always like joking with each other. So my idea was for this summer that we would try to just do that, you know, like fun facts and, and then do something more serious towards the end of it. And that's been kind of the format. So I'm, I really hope we can keep it going. And Calvin, who has been like the miraculous Wizard of Oz, putting it together, we send him the Zoom recordings and he has edited it. Amazing. I think he should do a mini forum on creating a podcast. Oh my gosh, that would be great. He'd be so good at that. I know. Mm -hmm. Um, I did listen to a few episodes of it and I thought, you know, at first I thought it was going to be like really piano oriented and I was like, oh, it'll be interesting, but maybe not like specifically for me. But y you talked about just, you know, music in general and it was just really relatable and then just food or anything you felt like talking about. Um, so it was actually really interesting to just listen to both of you talk. I'm so glad to hear that. But isn't it true? Don't Every musician you know, aren't they obsessed with food? That's been my experience. Yes, I'm definitely. To, yeah, I'm married to an orchestra player. My husband's in Cleveland Orchestra. And I mean, when they go on tour, it's all about, they have, 
some people have mapped out every single place they're going to eat on the whole tour. Yes. Yeah. I know someone who started a music festival for because of wine and right. near good vineyards. So, right. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I've heard you talk a lot about programming um, and specifically like keeping in mind um, like how we can sort of change the classical music world and progress and honestly catch up to the rest of the world. Um, what would be your advice to students and young professionals who are programming like their own recitals or concerts going forward? Yeah, that's such a big question. And I think it's one that's going to come up in our um, curriculum committee, which is about to be convened. And one idea for a mini forum I had was I would really like to have like a debate club for a couple of weeks where we take two opposing positions. One is that there is a kind of canon of music that's important to know and learn. And the other, that, um, it's time to abandon the canon, right? Mm -hmm. Those are two sides of the polarity. I think bo both voices need to be heard as we move forward. Um, mm -hmm. But there are so many resources out. So the, my first advice for that kind of programming would be um, seek out other resources. So don't just go to the same source, especially for pianists. We have so much music and most of it's very traditional. And so um, like one interview Oksana and I did was with her colleague and I didn't know him, William Nyaho Chapman, who has this whole big anthology of mu music of Africa and the African diaspora. Mm -hmm all these composers I wasn't equipped with who write for the piano. That's like a treasure trove that I didn't know existed. Right. Um, and uh, I think if you go to any big new music players website, they'll often have a listing of, of player of composers that they're working with or playing. And that can cause like this sort of peeling the onion, right? So you go mm -hmm. see the names of the composers then go to that composer and then you start to see another circle of um, influences, colleagues. Um, so that, that's a way to do it. As always, you have to have a path for what you're playing and why. It's not enough just to say, because I think that's where you can get in the charge of tokenism. Like, okay, I'm going to throw a woman composer on my program. Yes. <laughs> you have to really believe in what you're doing. So it, de it, it developing a sense about who you are, um, what, what's meaningful to you, what you do well, and or what you don't well do well and you want to challenge yourself with. Mm -hmm. and, and finally, with respect to programming, I always think it's super interesting to situate a composer in a milieu somehow, either mm -hmm. asking a question, were they strongly influenced by someone or are they, were they influential on someone else? who else was circulating around their time period. And that's where I can pull in, like in this program I did over the summer in looking at Clara Schumann's circle, you pull in people that you didn't expect. Like she actually did know and had um, at least a correspondence relationship with Fanny Mendelssohn, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that's how you do it. Yeah. Or one way to do it. Yeah, definitely. No, one of my favorite things to do is just go to other musicians or other um, ensembles, websites, and sort of see what their rep list is like, see what they're playing and who they're playing. Um, you can totally go down a rabbit hole that way. Definitely. Fun, fun, actually. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's like discovering new people to you and new music to you. So it's always really fun. Or asking the question, like I was asked to do, which got canceled, of course, because of this, to propose a Beethoven anniversary concert for at Cornell. But they said, really don't want you to play a lot of Beethoven on that concert. So that's a really interesting question, right? Interesting. Like, why circle that super important person in the Pantheon without actually playing much of his music? Right. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, Okay, so we've talked a lot about like advice you have for others and sort of your expertise, which you have a lot of, but you know, we're all sort of continuing to learn and grow just in our lives even. Um, so I was wondering what question or questions that you have that you're still looking for the answers to. Wow, yeah, my <laughs> usually always going a mile a minute full of questions. Um, you know, I've, I've thought a lot about um, 
whether it's important to have a sense of meaning in your life. Mm -hmm. And you know, there, there are not, not everybody thinks it is. And, um, and I've asked myself also, um, what were the influences in my growing up that created the person I am now? Uh, and that was a strong push in my own family, like your life needs to be meaningful. But what does that mean? You know, when we're gone, we're gone. We, or we don't know. When we're gone, we don't know. <laughs> but um, so the question of what constitutes a purposeful or meaningful life, that's a question I haven't answered, but I sort of, it constantly circulates in the back. Um, I wish I understood why I don't like to practice. <laughs> and I'm hoping I love that, to hear that. <laughs> and I'm hoping that the answer to that question comes to me sometime when I wake <laughs> up. <laughs> but I've noticed that like in taking on the grad director job, um, it has made me quite efficient because I never liked to sit at the instrument. And so I did learn how to pr practice pretty efficiently. So that's the upside to it, but. Yeah, definitely. I remember my high school teacher always told me to be greedy with my practice time while I was younger because it's just going to continue to go away. <laughs> I know. You get get busier and busier. Yeah, and you don't think you can, and then it just keeps getting busier. <laughs> I know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You know. There used to be in the back stairwell at Stony Brook a quote from South Park, and it was, mm -hmm. um, there's a time and a place for everything, and it's called college from Chef. <laughs> And my husband and I talk about, we do lament and it's so, it sounds so like old people, like in the good old days, but yeah. because um, I went to school in the eighties as did he, he went to Curtis and I was at Peabody and we didn't have, we didn't have cell phones or computers. So there was no, obviously no social media. So basically what we did in the evening was listen to music. Both of us did didn't know each other at the time. Like there wasn't anything else to do. Hang out, listen to music. Mm -hmm. And there was, um, it felt like a relaxed kind of pace, even though I was very busy in school, I had a lot of classes, I played for everyone. But it just, I don't know. It's when I look at you guys, current students, you know, the pressure to get advanced, all the pressures of life around you to live in New York, what happens after school. I was oblivious to all of that. And as a consequence, I had this sort of sense of a slow pace through my own education. Mm -hmm. And I wish there was a way to somehow do that still. Yeah, I agree, especially with like social media and, and the pressure to sort of have an online presence too. Right it almost feels like as soon as you start, like, why are you not online? Why don't you have music out? Why, you know, all these pressures. And yeah, sometimes it would be nice just to kind of have like four years of college to just practice and study. Um, and uh, many, most people don't have that like time anymore. I know I've always had a fantasy because we are part of this really interesting College of Arts and Sciences on Stony Brook mm -hmm. with multiple departments you know, we're, we're together with math, physics, chemistry, mm -hmm. um, philosophy. And I, I just wish there was space in our program for people to take classes in those other departments. I brought it up before, and there are all kinds of systemic barricades to that, including people's time, faculty, you know, time and mm -hmm. reciprocity and stuff. But, but yeah, just that vision of a college experience still explore before you have to be so tremendously specialized and focused. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, do you have anything else you would like to say to everyone or any anything you'd like to promote going forward? Any, if you, you know, normally we would do concerts coming up, but that's not so much anymore. <laughs> but. Well, I would encourage um, if new students are, uh, new students in the department are watching today at all, just encourage you to reach out um, to any opportunities you connect with the community of Stony Brook in the department, whether that's going to studio classes or um, availing yourself of a mini forum, or I don't know, um, taking the initiative to reach out to other newbies in your studio, like, hey, I'm one of four or six new pianists, let's have a coffee hour at 10 every Tuesday or something like that, <laughs> so that so that there's not an increased sense of isolation. And like you're saying, 
there's a great pressure for us all to produce in this online world, which can be really stressful. And I think it is okay to step back to ask yourself, okay, with the time I've gained from not commuting or, you know, sadly from not playing concerts, what, how could I use this time, you know, in a, in some creative and productive way where you just, where you don't immediately buy into like, I've got to do this. Right. Yeah. So that would be my, my word of encouragement to new people and to the continuing students. I'd say, Hey, remember what it was like to come here and then you can't go in the walk in the building and see people. And so to also reach out from that direction. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I, you know, ex extending that to reaching out to current uh, grad students as well for the new students, everyone is so like willing to help and get to know everyone. Right. Uh, there's so much collaboration that goes on normally in Stony Brook. So definitely reaching out, I think, is an yeah. awesome thing. Yeah, and there's a lot of collaboration and a lot of help all across the university. There's also a lot of bureaucracy and confusion. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Bummed by that to reach out for help when you need it. Um, because like even I had to look up something in our handbook the other day and I was like, I don't, I, I'm reading the words and I still don't get it. So it, yeah, just that stuff can become overwhelming and just ask, ask your advisor, your teacher, other students who might give you wrong advice, but at least that'll give you some place to start. Yeah, definitely. Okay, cool. Well, thank you so much for joining me today and for talking with us. Um, oh, being our first Mentor Monday interview. I'm so excited and I'm so um, like thrilled with the work of your committee. It's, mm -hmm. it, I don't know if Catherine told every, if you told everybody before when you started, but you're part of the social media committee. That's such a great step for us in the department, despite what we're saying about the pressures of social media, but look what we can do, right? We can have a conversation, mm -hmm. people can watch it and you have tremendous ideas. So this is a great development for Definitely. us. Yeah, Definitely. thank you. Yeah, we're looking forward to sort of promoting all the faculty and students and even alumni um, throughout the year. So, yeah. I'm Remind me what your, so it's Mentor Monday. What are your days of the week? So we're doing Mentor Monday, Tuesday. I believe we just changed to Tutti Tuesday, like T-U-T-E-E. -E. Um, okay. So it'll be more of a student, um, student spotlights there. Uh, we're going to do workshop Wednesdays. So that's going to be sort of recaps of classes that went on or workshops or guests that came in the like the week before. So this week, I believe we're having the clarinet studio class, just sort of like a one minute recap um, of anything that was interesting that popped up. Um, Thursdays will be throwback Thursday. So if anyone has like old videos they want to share or just kind of resurface um, or old recordings or publications, we're gonna sort of highlight them. And then Feature Friday, so every, every Friday at seven, we have a uh, YouTube premiere and Facebook premiere of a, it's basically a concert and it's, uh, I limited it to an hour. I said, no more, <laughs> we, we wanna keep it short and sweet. But it's not just recordings of people playing, it's also um, people speaking about what they're playing. So it's sort of a more intimate feeling than just watching a recording. Sure. Um, and then Saturdays, we're going to highlight some of the um, alumni doing Spotlight Saturdays. Um, and then Sunday, we just let everyone know what's coming up that week. So they'll, they'll be prepared. Great idea. And um, most of it will come through Instagram Live like this? Yeah, we're thinking of doing most of the um, interviews on Instagram Live. We'll probably repost some of them to Facebook to, you know, get the whole audience. Um, so basically, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube are the places that people want to follow us. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Catherine. Yeah, thank you, Tina. Have a good day. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Bye.